What is up everybody and welcome to the first of an upcoming series of videos where I talk about my top 10 movies of every single year starting with my favorite era of movies or just media in general and that is the 80s. So this is going to be my top 10 movies of the year 1980. Now this is an idea that was brought up in sorts by my patrons over on Patreon. If you guys are not sure what Patreon is, that's essentially my crowdfunding source. So if you enjoy what I do, if you enjoy this channel, you want to help contribute to it success or you want to get some of the exclusive stuff that I have over there like exclusive Q&A's and live streams early access videos things like that please click the link down below in the video description or go to patreon.com slash Cody Leach or just type in my name in the search bar and you'll find me there's lots of different tiers lots of different benefits for each tier but every single month with the exception of September and October being balls to the wall as they were I let my patrons do a poll and choose a topic for a video and they wanted me to do top 10 horror movies of 1980 and I decided to kind of reform that idea and turn it into a video series. That is what you're watching right now. So thank you so much again to all of my continued support on my patrons uh, and if you guys want to consider that I appreciate it very much and if not no big deal. But 1980. Now this is a year, uh, continuing on in this video series, I'm going to have a lot more movies to talk about a lot more passionately, but 1980 as I was cycling through it, when I first made my draft list for what became this video, I had only seen 11 films in 1980, so I started to look at it, is my top 10 really my top 10, or are these just the only 10 movies that I've seen? So I've watched about 4 or 5 movies that uh, I should have seen by now from 1980, and uh, this is definitely going to be a list where I'm very passionate about making maybe the top five or so, and then I've got five other pretty good movies that would not necessarily make my top ten on other lists, but they made my top ten for this year. And finally, the last thing that I need to say, because I know I'm going to get hundreds of these comments, is that this is my own personal top ten. These are my favorite movies of 1980. I don't imagine yours is going to line up with mine. And so, if there's a movie that you love from this year that did not make my list, please do not ask, hey, Where's that movie? You forgot that one. Because I guarantee you, I did not forget it. One of two things happened. Either A, I've never seen it, or B, I've seen it, and it's just not one of my favorites of the year. Coming in at number 10 is going to be a little slasher film called Prom Night. Now, this is certainly not one of the best quality slashers out there, but I will tell you, I saw this movie for the very first time when I was like maybe 10 years old. It was on cable really late at night. It might have been like one or two in the morning. It was pitch black out. Not a soul, not a creature was stirring in my house except for me. And I turned this on and just the opening five to 10 minutes with these kids playing this little killer tag game in this abandoned warehouse and where things go by the end of that sequence, it scared the living fuck out of me to where I was just like, I was on edge, followed by the phone calls with the nameless faceless killer. And what then transpires is a pretty run of the mill 80s slasher film that is certainly, you know, a little bit more guerrilla style. It doesn't have the budget, doesn't have the resources that some of the more higher profile slasher films of the 80s. But despite the lower budget and the lower production value, I still think it's actually a pretty effective little slasher flick. You got Jamie Lee Curtis back in her early Scream Queen days. There is some decent kills, one of which is a decapitation I think is pretty iconic for the, the genre. And and the eventual reveal of the killer actually has a bit of an emotional punch to it, given the way that the movie opens up. So it's not going to be a favorite of mine if I'm just talking about slashers. And I think there's very few people out there that would put this in their top three or four slashers in general. But for 1980, it's actually a movie that has always stuck with me. Coming in at number nine is a movie called Motel Hell. And this is essentially a horror comedy take on the Texas Chainsaw subgenre if you can call it that. This is a film that I actually remember my grandmother having the VHS tape and in their little opened up case. They used to have this VHS case where you would open it up like a bookshelf and you would have movies on this shelf, this shelf and everything in between. And I was always intrigued by it because of the cover of it. And I remember my dad coming by one night and I was like, what's this Motel Hell movie? And he told me the basic premise of it. And I was really intrigued, but never actually watched it. I had quite a few of those movies as a kid. I would always be more comfortable watching a movie I had already seen. So I eventually did watch this when it came out on uh, Scream Factory, maybe about four or five years ago. And it's a pretty entertaining little horror comedy. You got this little farmer, Vincent, and uh, you know he's got the town awards for the best sausage and the best fritters and the best meat. 
and essentially he is kidnapping people that check into his little motel, burying them up to their necks, and then killing them and making meats out of them. And so it's very much in the vein of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and what it's going for, but it's played for laughs, it's played for goofiness. I mean, there's a chainsaw fight at one point where they're wearing pig faces, and it, it, it's wild. If you like Texas Chainsaw, maybe even more so if you like Texas Chainsaw 2 and you dig that kind of tone, this is a movie that fits very well into that type of fandom. And so it's not as well known as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but I think that it's actually pretty damn entertaining and, and has a lot of things that you would go to that franchise for that in some aspects might be more entertaining for you if you check out Motel Hell. Number eight is gonna be The Elephant Man. Now this is actually one of my very, very early Patreon request reviews. And uh, it's a movie that I would not necessarily ever want to watch again. It's certainly a dark, depressing movie, but it's a very well-made movie. And it's based off of a true story to where you had this man who is just horribly disfigured with these birth defects. And so he has to walk around wearing like a little sack over his head. And you have Anthony Hopkins that is this professor, this doctor that uh, finds him and kind of becomes enamored with him and wants to help him, wants to kind of, you know, bring the humanity out in him. And it's just a very touching movie where you meet this man that has been treated as a monster his entire life and has such a good heart and has such a good nature to him. And he finally is treated like the human being that he is. And uh, it, it ends in a place that's, you know, not the happiest note to end on, but uh, it's a very good touching story. I don't think it's a type of movie that you would rewatch all that often. Maybe there's some that love it on that level, but uh, it's one that is absolutely worth watching. You know, it's a Lynch movie, so you definitely have a lot of trippy visuals and the movie even ends with a lot of these weird visual metaphors to kind of soften the blow of where the story actually ends. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a movie that I'm glad that I saw it. I'm glad that I reviewed it and uh, I'm glad that I don't have to watch it ever again, cause, woo! All right, I'm gonna go cry. Number seven is gonna be Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill. And this is another movie that I've actually reviewed on my channel. It was a, another request from a, a viewer that, um, we'll just say it was under much worse circumstances and that's as far as I'll get into it. But uh, Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill is one of those movies that I had not seen from Brian De Palma. And it was one that I was looking forward to checking out because I love Michael Caine. I'm a big fan of a lot of Brian De Palma movies. I mean, Carlito's Way, Scarface, The Untouchables. Like when he does gangster shit, basically. That really cracks my my top movies, period. So I love what the guy does. I love the way that he shoots, the way that he builds tension, the way that he, uh, you know, even the way that he uses scores, I think is very good. He's one of those iconic filmmakers that uh, I wish would, would still be making some movies, but he had a little error there that he certainly carved out a legacy for himself. And Dress to Kill is essentially like a murder mystery to where you uh, you have a woman that's killed in the elevator a la Psycho, where you feel like that's going to be your main character for the movie, and uh, guess not! <laughs> and essentially the rest of the movie you're following other characters trying to figure out what happened, who the killer is, and it goes to some very interesting and... Uh, strange places <laughs> with where it decides to reveal the killer and the killer's motivation and everything. And it's just got a very sexually brutal tone to it. Like even the kill in the elevator just feels like it's a very violating kill. Even though it's just a woman getting carved up with a straight razor, it, there's something about it that has this sexual nature to the film. It, even just the, the poster of the movie showing the leg and uh, the fishnet stocking or whatever's on it. It just, it has that, that very uncomfortable tone to where what's going on is no different than other slasher movies and things like that, but it just feels a little more personal. It feels a little bit more of a violent violation and that's what I've always taken away from this movie and remembered it for so if you're a big fan of Brian De Palma or just a big fan of this early horror thrillers definitely check it out because it's got a lot of unique aspects to it that I haven't seen in a lot of movies that rub shoulders with it in its own genre. Number six is gonna be the original Mad Max. Now, this is actually the last Mad Max movie that I ever saw. I had seen uh, Road Warrior years ago when I was a kid, but it wasn't one of those movies that had staying power with me for whatever reason. Just didn't, didn't latch into me whenever I was a young kid. And it wasn't until Mad Max Fury Road came out and then the video game Mad Max as well, which was pretty damn awesome, that suddenly I had like this Mad Max Fury, no pun intended, that I needed to be 
fulfilled. So I, I went out and I bought the Blu-ray for all three of the movies before Fury Road. And uh, I had already seen bits of Thunderdome as well, namely the, the opening of it. And so Mad Max was the last one that I had ever watched. And I had had a lot of people tell me, even my father told me like, hey, that one's a lot different. You know, it's got a lot more of an Australian tone. It's a lot more lower budget. It's not the big, crazy action spectacle that the others were going for. And that's absolutely true, but I still really enjoyed this first one. The original Mad Max is a very simple revenge movie where you have this, you know, post-apocalyptic future that certainly is not as built out or as realized in the other movies for budget limitations, but you have Mel Gibson as Max, and his wife and son, I believe, are killed by this road gang, and he takes revenge on them and kills them one by one. And I just really dug it. It has a very old school, dirty, nasty tone to it. Uh, it still has a lot of the flavor and a lot of the style that we found in, especially the two Mel Gibson sequels, but it was simpler. It was smaller scale, and so it has a very unique feel to it within the franchise, and I believe Shout Factory had a release for it. I don't know if it's still out there. That's the one that I watched, so if you are a fan of Mad Max Fury Road or The Road Warrior or the few of us that really love Thunderdome, and you've been curious where this franchise got its starts, check it out, because, uh, yeah, I had a good time with it. It's, it's still one of my, my favorites of 1980. Now we're cracking the top five, and these are honestly the five that I really remember from this year. These are the ones that I continuously rewatch or talk about or will be standouts whenever I think of the year 1980. And number five for me is going to be John Carpenter's The Fog. Now I recently reviewed this movie about two months back so if you want to check out all of my thoughts on it that's a very fresh review and I'll continue on with my John Carpenter review series here in, within a week or so we'll say. And The Fog is a movie that I watched early on as a kid uh, because I loved Halloween and I loved Christine and my dad had told me about the premise of The Fog. A lot of my favorite movies of all time start off with this story where my dad hinted at a story and I was like, I need to watch that shit. And so I rented the movie The Fog when I was with my grandma at the video store, conned her into giving me this horror film and watched it and has always stuck with me as a really cool stylistic ghost story. And that's exactly what it is. It was John Carpenter trying to give just an old school ghost story, but bring his form of style to it. And despite the fact that the characters in this movie are not all that great, that was the biggest thing that I kind of realized on this most recent rewatch is I remember this more for the concept and the visuals than I do any of the characters. It's still a very cool, stylistic, and fun movie. It's got that creepy, haunting vibe to it. You got a great score from John Carpenter that just adds to that. A lot of great atmosphere, a lot of really cool visuals within the fog, and the way that these lepers, these pirates, these ghosts are realized is very minimal, but very cool. And there's also some pretty good kills in there if you're in it for more of the violence and more of the slasher stuff that he actually had to reshoot and put into the movie out of fear that his Halloween fans were not going to care for his film without some blood and some gore. So it's a film that I've always hung on to as one of the cooler John Carpenter films. It's not one of his best as far as top five for me, but that's it's a John Carpenter filmography. There's so many fucking awesome movies there that saying it doesn't make your top five is not an insult whatsoever. But as far as stylish horror films from the 80s, this is one that will always stand out to me. Number four is gonna be Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. Some people would call this the greatest boxing film of all time. I have a few that I would put on that list before Raging Bull, but this is one that I've always remembered just because of the artistry behind the camera and the dedication in front of the camera. It's a black and white movie it's told in a very almost documentary style in a certain way. It's about a real life boxer, Jake LaMotta. And you have Robert De Niro, just one of his all time performances where he just gives it his all as far as physical transformation. I mean, he's in incredible shape during the younger version of Jake LaMotta when he's doing all the boxing scenes. And then later on in the movie where you have like these, you know, the, the older version, the retired version, the uh, past his prime version of Jake LaMotta, he gained a lot of weight, and it's a very interesting transformation to see on screen. Christian Bale's kind of the guy that we know nowadays as the big physical com um, chameleon, but Robert De Niro was one of the people that really dedicated himself to his craft early on with things like this, because what he gives to the character of Jake LaMotta, I mean, it's just... It's one of the dozens of times that you look at Robert De Niro's performances and go, dude, that's... That's the fucking goat right there. But the way that they tell the story, the way that they delve into the drama of this guy and his kind of his rise in boxing and all the way through to the end where he's fighting this guy and 
just wants to prove that he can't knock him down. You get a very early performance from Joe Pesci, who was kind of unknown at the time. With if you can even think of Joe Pesci being unknown, this is one of those times where he came onto the scene and just came on with ferocity. And it's no question why Scorsese continued to use him. And we got some of the all time great performances from that guy and uh, really good old school boxing scenes too. So it's not as flashy, it's not as Hollywoodized, it's not as, well I guess we'll say action packed as some other movies in the genre that I, th I think probably more people would be entertained by, but Raging Bull is one of those boxing sports movies that really you just admire all the artistry that it's showing. Number three is actually one of those movies that I watched in preparation for this video because I had never seen it before and I wanted to watch at least four or five more movies from this year and see if any of them cracked the list. And not only did this one crack the list, it made top three. And that is The Changeling. Now this is a movie that I had heard about, I had seen the poster, uh, I had seen a few people mention it throughout the years. I think Don Mancini mentioned it in season one of Chucky when he did the little stairwell fire stunt and said it was kind of an homage to that. Uh, maybe once or twice on like a horror top 10 I've seen it kind of dropped in there. But for whatever reason, it's never really been a movie that I've felt a lot of conversation around. So that's probably one of the reasons why I have not seen it sooner. And so I put this movie on and you got George C. Scott here, who I love from The Exorcist 3, and he moves into this house after a big tragedy regarding his wife and daughter, and right from the get-go, he is haunted by this spirit, this presence that is in this house. And what I liked about this movie, aside from the fact that it's just old school creepy, it's like the prototype for what things like The Conjuring and a lot of movies in that subgenre have taken inspiration from, so it's simpler, and I think it's done better in a lot of ways. But I like the fact that this is not like a scare fest movie to where this ghost is tormenting George C. Scott and just making him have all these jump scares and trying to make his life miserable. It's just trying to communicate. And George C. Scott, the entire movie, is not petrified of this presence. He's not scared out of the house. He's not on edge. He's actually trying to investigate it and figure out what it wants and figure out the origins of it. And you go along this little murder mystery of what exactly happened to this presence. And some of the things that are revealed are pretty fucked up. And so I really, really enjoyed this one to the point where I immediately bought the 4K. I immediately told my dad to watch it, let him borrow it. And uh, it's one of those movies that any time from now on when I'm talking about haunting movies or supernatural movies, this is gonna be part of the conversation because it was just so damn good. Coming in at number two, speaking of haunting movies that are so damn good, you have Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Now, The Shining to me is one of those movies that every single time that I watch it, I get something different or something new out of it. And you know, sometimes I'm really in the mood for it and this is like one of the greatest horror films of all time. Other times, there's things that have been inspired by The Shining that I tend to find myself leaning a little bit more towards, but there is no question that this is one of the most brilliant horror films ever made and one of the more brilliant horror stories as well. And I actually think that the existence of the Doctor Sleep movie has just made me love it even more, seeing where that story continues and, and pretty much concludes in Doctor Sleep. You have one of the career best performances by Jack Nicholson, one of the biggest and most renowned horror performances of all time. And you have like Shelley Duvall and the whole story of all the torment that she went through for Kubrick to get the performance that he wanted out of her that's pretty horrific and a lot of just trippy visuals in this movie. But what I love about The Shining, aside from the fact that it's just masterfully executed, is that there is always so much discussion and debate and theorizing around what this means and what does that visual mean and what does the ending mean to where even 40 plus years later, there's still so much discussion in fans about what they get out of this film and nobody's really wrong. There's people that think that, hey, Jack Nicholson's reincarnated. You know, he's a reincarnated caretaker of this hotel. There's other people that think, oh, he was absorbed into the hotel by the end of it. There's others that think, oh, you know, he's just, he's stuck in this picture and his soul is there. Like there's so many different theories and all of them hold a certain amount of water to it to where you're like, hmm, that's actually an interesting point. And the way that it slow builds throughout the movie of just, you know, th this vast, massive hotel that is so huge you could probably sleep in a different room in it every single night of the year and still not see the whole, whole hotel and at the same time there's so much isolation because of that 
And that's just such a cool concept that I've seen in a few movies like, you know, even The Thing where it's in Antarctica. It's just vast openness, but there's also so much isolation because of that, that it's just a really effective setting. And then you have all these little trippy things that happen throughout it where Jack Nicholson sees something in room 237 and he goes and has a drink and says he'll sell his soul. All of a sudden there's a barkeep there, a bartender. Uh, he walks in on a party full of all these people and then you see the, the reveal that Shelley Duvall finds this novel that he's been writing for months is just him slowly losing his mind. And even some of the things that Danny sees, the two girls in the hallway, probably the most iconic scene of the movie. There's just so much in The Shining that is continuously rewatchable and continuously giving if you're somebody that likes to kind of dig beneath the surface that, uh, yeah, not only one of the greatest movies of 1980, just one of the greatest movies ever. But number one for me is absolutely Friday the 13th. <laughs> the fuck out of here are you kidding me did you actually believe that come on number one for me is the empire strikes back now i debated pretty hard between my number one and my number two but empire strikes back is a movie that i think is a bit more rewatchable than the shine and rewatch factor always plays pretty hard into the the ratings and the where i stack things in my little head cannon ranking and so empire strikes back was not my favorite Star Wars movie as a kid, Return of the Jedi was, but as I kind of got into my teenage years and the more that I rewatched that original trilogy, Empire Strikes Back pulled ahead and it has been my favorite ever since to this day and to where I, I still think that it's one of the greatest you know, space fantasies or if you want to even try to call it sci-fi movies, which I would not, uh, it's one of the greatest movies of either of those genres because there's just so much in it. I mean, there's action, there's great characters, there's a lot of really good comedy. Every single thing in the first film is built upon and expanded on in a really nice way. There's so many things that are introduced that are left off for Return of the Jedi in a way that's satisfying to where even if I did have to wait years to see Return of the Jedi, I would just be on the edge of my seat. I wouldn't be frustrated at the lack of answers about how the hell Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. Who's this Boba Fett dude? What's gonna go on with Han Solo? And what is this Jabba the Hutt they keep talking about? So many things that are eventually brought to really nice conclusions in Return of the Jedi, but Empire Strikes Back is one of the perfect middle chapters in a trilogy in Hollywood history to where so many things about it are so iconic and are so memorable for just that middle chapter and standout sequences but there's also so much of just building the story and expanding on what came before. Star Wars could have been a nice little one and done, but when you move on to Empire Strikes Back, they were able to just expand on it to a way to where it just builds out the world even more, expands on what is potential in this franchise, in this universe, to the point where it's still one of the biggest, most successful franchises of all time to this day and just continues to crank out new shows and movies and things like that to varying qualities. But Empire Strikes Back is just one of those films that will always be very important to me. As much as I have grown to be a very casual Star Wars fan with where the sequel trilogy went and where a lot of the Disney Plus stuff has gone, where I kind of lost a lot of interest in Star Wars, if I can be honest with you, that original trilogy will always be important to me and this will always probably be my favorite piece of it. And for all of those reasons, Empire Strikes Back is my number one movie of 1980. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, please click over here for a playlist of all of my new release reviews from 2022. And I'm also gonna put my most recent 33 on 31 list up here if you're a fan of 80 slashers. There's a lot of them in that list. It's Michael, Jason, and Freddy going head to head. Please like and share and hit that subscribe button on this channel so that you don't miss the rest of this series. And as always, remember, Opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.